be thinking here about some of these fears, you know, that we have some are irrational, some can be unhealthy, some can even get to the point where they're crippling or debilitating, but we all wrestle with them from the seemingly silly to the more dramatic. Some of the more serious ones, who hasn't felt some of these, the fear of serious illness or financial collapse or failure or rejection or just some sudden calamity or trouble? These and other related fears are fears that can hinder our relationship with God, but the fear we're going to talk about today is actually one that can help our relationship with God. It's a fear that the Bible says is the foundation, the bedrock, the source of wisdom, the source of something good, something beneficial, not the kind of fear that is the progenitor of irrational or unhealthy terror or fright, not the kind of fear that's living in terror, punishment or judgment, but rather the kind of fear that's fueled by having a clear understanding of who we are and who God is. And the Bible talks about that, that who or what we're supposed to fear in order to gain wisdom in one of the five wisdom books that are in the Bible. What are the wisdom books in the Bible? There are five of them. Proverbs, Proverbs. Job, Job. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Proverbs. There's the fifth one. Okay, so those are the five. In the first chapter of Proverbs, one of the wisdom literature. Here's what it says about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, true knowledge or wisdom, and evidently it leads to benefits and good things. But fools do not fear God. They despise His wisdom. They mock His direction or correction or the instruction That he provides. Just as on one hand the fear of God leads to wisdom and good things, the opposite is true. Foolishness results if we're not interested in the wisdom of God. Folly accompanies that person. And in a sense, if we don't want the wisdom of God, you can get wise counsel, you can have ample resources, you can have relational support, you can even have some brain knowledge, but they are of no help to the person who does not first and foremost fear God. The fear of God is a great support to us. It's a great aid. Not to mention that many of your other fears that we or you and I may have, which adversely impact us and hinder our relationship with God, the fear of God actually improves our relationship with God. 120 times in the Old and New Testament, the fear of God is mentioned. Maybe you've read some of those passages and you've wondered to yourself, wait, am I missing something? Fear God. I mean, okay, I love God. I worship Him. I I pray. I do my best to trust Him. I I, I try to follow uh, what He's telling me to do. But for many of us, I really can't give a good answer of what it means to fear God. So we're going to spend a little bit of time today and the rest of this month shedding light on that because it's clear from the Bible that it's really important to God. And so it should be really important to us as well. And one of the things you may be surprised by, we'll look at a few of these today, God makes dozens of promises to those who fear him. Dozens of good and beneficial promises, and we'll look at a few of those here. I believe what I'm going to share with us today, here at the beginning of the year, in many respects, can be a life-changing concept. But if you get your arms and heart around it, it will change the way you do life. It will change the way that you live your faith out. And I do believe in understanding this fear, you're going to get power over all the other fears that come into your life. And who wouldn't want that? I mean, think about what some of your fears are. A few of you have already shared uh, some of them. But as you're entering 2024, if you were just honest with yourself, what are some fears? You have some fears right now. Maybe it's losing your job. Maybe it's, man, the culture's just going crazy. Maybe you fear people you love becoming ill or passing away. Maybe it's debt. Maybe you fear your upcoming semester at school. Maybe you fear global warming. Maybe you fear another world war. Maybe you fear identity theft. I don't know. But what do you fear? Just take a moment, just silently. What fear comes to mind for you right now? And my tenet is, over these next handful of months, if we grow in our fear of God, whatever that fear is you just thought of, will begin to diminish in importance and impact and negative impact in your life. So we're going to look at fear today. It sounds odd, but I'm going to try to help you learn how to fear. 
in this way and encourage you to fear because God tells us it's important and it's necessary. There are two ways the Bible tells us that we fear God. Two ways. The first of all, first one is this. We fear God with awesome dread. Awesome dread. And you say, Rob, where's that come from? Well, the first time the word fear appears in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. It's here in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 10. After Adam and Eve had sinned and God drew near, Adam hid himself from God's presence. And then he explains, I heard, this is Adam, I heard the sound of you, God, in the garden. And I was afraid and because I was naked and I hid myself. First time fear appears in Scripture. And I want to make this point. I'm sure what Adam felt at that moment was much more than just awe and reverence of God. He was stone cold afraid. Exactly as he should have been. Why? Because God warned him if he ate of the fruit of that tree, he would die. And here God shows up. He had, Adam had done what he was told not to do. And he knew what the consequence would be. And God's looking for him and God's finding him. What else could Adam be thinking then if God finds me, I'm dead? The reason I bring this up is because I think there are many in Christianity today who seem to think that since Jesus came, we've eliminated any need to fear God. (laughs) Those who adopt this mindset as the whole truth often focus and describe Jesus as gentle, compassionate, and loving, and he was all those things. But he is a lot more than just those things. He is the fearsome Jesus who took a whip and single-handedly drove from the temple a mass of thieving merchants. He's the fearsome Jesus who will come again to judge the living and the dead. You can be sure Adam felt fear. Awe and dread are natural responses of the imperfect to the perfect, of the marred to the beautiful, of the contaminated to the pure. When Jesus, for example, walked into the temple that day, they weren't afraid of him because he had a whip. Many had whips. They were afraid of him because the presence of the Almighty God was in their midst. In the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 8, verse 13, But the Lord of the host, but the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. I just activated Siri or something. Oh, no, that's Christine. (laughs) Now, whatever you may think about the fear of God, let me just put it on the table up front. There's this sense in which you and I need to cultivate a healthy fear of God. We're meant to take God seriously. Not just to be indifferent or blasé or eh, whatever. When it comes to fearing God, the first thing it means is awesome dread. There's another way that we fear God, and this is the way we're all more comfortable with, what we might call astonished devotion, astonished devotion. The Bible tells us that as Christians, that this is also supposed to be a part of our experience of our lives as Christians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, If you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with what? Fear throughout the time of your exile. And he goes on, knowing that you are ransomed with the precious blood of Jesus. For those who are following Jesus, this concept is the most meaningful for everyday living. We fear God by honoring him, by reverencing him, by cherishing him. We fear him because of his greatness, his majesty, which reduce us with this overpowering sense that nothing we ever confront in this world is like the God that we serve. When we truly worship God, we enter into the wonder of who he is. When we hit our pinnacle of our worship experiences, we're brought into the presence of God whom we serve, and we're made aware of his majesty and wonder, and we get caught up in it, Because for a moment or so, we're made aware the God of the universe is the God that we actually know and the God that actually knows us. This may go without saying because I think it's self-evident. There used to be more of God fear in the past than there is today. 
even among those who didn't know or follow God. It used to be in our culture that there was maybe a kind of distant, but nonetheless, respect for God. A certain kind of respect for those who know God. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but that's not around anymore. We've lost that. Let me say it a different way. We used to have great and high regard for someone if we would say about that person, he or she is a God-fearing man or woman. You'd say that about somebody today and people would be uncomfortable. They might even mock you. But a God-fearing man or God-fearing woman used to be someone that folks looked up to. Of those people, we would say, we respect them. We may not believe them. We may not follow and do the same, but we respect them. We don't have that anymore. I frequently ponder, maybe you do too, what's gone wrong in our time, in our nation. I read articles, I read books, I talk with folks, I pray, I sometimes lose sleep at night. Are the many reasons that, you know, what's going wrong with our, the answers to that question of what's going wrong with our culture and our nation, we could, many, but I think we could boil it down to one issue that's gone wrong in our country, and it's this. We've lost our fear of God. We've lost our sense of reverence for God. And we've jettisoned many of the godly principles that used to form and make up our culture and country. You may ask, Rob, why should we fear God? Here's a few reasons why I think we should fear God. And all the rest of this lesson um, is going to be taken from mostly all of the wisdom books, Psalms, in Proverbs. So get ready. Lots of scriptures coming at you here. Jot them down. Please jot these down and review them more in depth later. Why, why should we fear God? Number one, because of who he is. Because of who he is. Psalm 89 says, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. Or maybe in Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 6, there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. What's his due? He needs to be feared. For among all the wise ones of all the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. We should fear God because of who he is. There's none like him. As mentioned earlier, there's a difference between living in terror and punishment or judgment versus having a clear understanding of who we are and who God is, there's no one like him. And that difference, that gap needs to inform our humility, our sobriety, and our willingness to heed his call and follow his commands in our lives. The second reason we should fear God is because of what he's done. Psalm 33, verse 6 helps us. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. I mean, think of it. What has God done? He spoke and the world came into existence. And the psalmist helps us picture this. He's gathering the waters into a heap and holding them in his hand. The God that we serve, the, the God before whom we stand in awe and fear and wonder is the God who created the world in which we live, and he didn't need any help doing it. He created it out of nothing, spoke it into being. He's the almighty God, and we should worship him and fear him because of what he has done and who he is, but thirdly, because of what he is doing. Because of what he is doing. Psalm 66. He's at work today. We should fear him because of this. Psalm 66 verse 5. Come and see the works of the Lord. He is awesome in doing his doing toward the sons of men. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. Let me ask you. What is he doing today that should inspire awe and fear in us? You could come up with many things to put in that list. But I want to focus on one. If you wonder why we should be in fear of God because of what he is doing, let me say just one word, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Psalm 130 reads this way, verse 3, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Now watch this. That you may be feared. Some of us were forgiven our sin when we were born again many, many years ago. 
Maybe we've forgotten. Maybe we no longer allow ourselves to wonder and marvel in that truth that a holy God who is 100% righteous, no flaw in him, could accept us through this simple process of forgiveness. When it comes down to it, there are only two kinds of sinners. Those who are forgiven and those who are not. And forgiveness has been made available to all, right? We know that. Those who believe in Jesus, those who confess Him as Lord, those who repent and are baptized, and thus receiving forgiveness of their sin. It's the great work that God is doing today. Forgiveness. Offering forgiveness. Extending salvation for all who will hear and accept. I looked over the last year and a half or so, some of those baptized just here in our group. Caden, Esai, Marissa, Luke. Ellie, Vanessa, Heather, Isaiah, Guy, Jasmine, Bella, Janine, Joni. Lives changed. A whole new direction from where they were heading. Life transforming, joy and peace empowered with new purpose and meaning. That's the work God is doing today. And also those who were baptized 20, 30, 40 years ago. Look around this audience and the people I see. I see Rich McAlder, I see Chaz, I see Dave Wed. I see Jim Hess. Jay Upright, and so many more. Never forget the miracle and glory of being forgiven because that's God's greatest ongoing and present work. Forgiveness. Your forgiveness. My forgiveness. And in 2024, each one of us in the South region, I, I want to encourage, I've been praying and that I pray for all of us that we would love more, work more, Pray more fervently in this regard of sharing this message of forgiveness with our friends and family. I pray in 2024 each one of us would take more steps of courage in that regard. That each one of us would be praying to be involved with someone who becomes a Christian this year. That each one of us would experience the joy of opening the Bible with someone who is not yet saved, who's still lost. For many of us, it's been too long. I believe this year is the year to pray, to partner, to join, to open your mouth more, to invite more, to practice more hospitality, and to walk in step with and be fueled by the Holy Spirit through it all. Many of us old timers know a hymn that speaks to this called Lead Me to Some Soul Today. And if you know the lyrics, we'll just kind of recite them here. Lead me, Lord, lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to Say, friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care. And few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today. Will you join in praying that prayer this year? To make this one of your goals, one of your hopes, one of your prayers, one of your oft-repeated petitions to the Lord. To care for those who are lost. As the hymn says, to pray fervently, even daily for them. To ask God to melt your heart in this regard. And to fill you with the right words to say. Before we get to the concluding part of this message, we've got to answer this one question, which I get a lot, which is this. How can I love God and fear Him at the same time? Because it seems like maybe the scriptures are a bit contradictory in this regard. For example, maybe you think of this passage in 1 John 18. There is no fear in love. Okay, wait, hold on. But perfect fear, love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now we know we have this passage, and we have these other passages telling us we're to fear God, we're to love Him, but you can't love Him and not fear Him. Are they in conflict? No, they're not in conflict actually at all. What this verse tells us is, is when we truly know the fear of God, we will understand the love of God. And when we truly know the love of God, we understand the fear of God. They work together. They're not, it's not either or, it's both and. They're not mutually exclusive. It, only in our own minds does it become that way. And not only that, but when you read this and notice how many rewarding gifts and promises God links to fear, you also begin to see that fear, which leads to obedience, results in blessings, which draws us nearer to God, and then we see even in greater detail how loving God really is. That's how it works. I wasn't aware how many places in the Bible we're given promises if we will fear the Lord. 
I can only give you a few, and that's how we'll end today. I'll give you a few of these to kind of jumpstart your thinking. But these are things the Bible says will be ours if we learn to fear the Lord. Here's the first promise. This is in Psalm chapter 34. The first promise is promise of provision. They're going to be all P's. You can just write these one-word things down. Provision. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack, no want, no need. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Bible says if you fear God, he will provide for you. The second thing you get is a promise of protection. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. When you fear God, he protects you. Third promise is purity. Psalm 103, not on the screen, but I'll read this one on the screen in a moment. Third promise of fearing God is purity. As far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, verse 12, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And then in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So according to these verses, godly fear is a necessary ingredient to sanctification and maturing in our spirituality. The fear of God is not only the key to our knowledge, but it's essential to our maturity. If we do not have a healthy awe and fear of God, we cannot grow. We can never become mature. We stifle sanctification, this process of becoming more like Jesus, and we stagnate. For those folks, they will always be like little children. So far, the fear of God is linked to the promises of provision, protection, and purity. Here's another one, Psalm 128, the promise of prosperity. Once again, watch for the fear word. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. So prosperity, fruitful labor, happiness, enough food to eat. Despite such setbacks and challenges, it will generally go well. And then the children, these olive plants, they, they will blossom in some fashion that the Lord orchestrates. And they will adopt over time, hopefully, the, ways of their, the godly ways of their parents. Some of those children may themselves become disciples in early life. Other of those children may simply live according to a more godly, a more or less godly worldview until perhaps later becoming disciples. But in the meantime, they adult well. They rise up like olive plants. They find purpose and trajectory and they get along well with their parents. Still other children may follow a different timeline. And for those parents who continue in God ways, God's ways and continue to sow seeds, maybe their kids' choices for the Lord will come after their parents actually leave the planet. We don't know. But there is a promise of prosperity in all of those ways. And the final promise we'll look at is this one in Proverbs 10, the promise of prolonged days. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. The Bible says, and this is a principle, it's a general principle like we often find in wisdom literature of Psalms and Proverbs, that in the long run, over the long haul, statistically over a a sample population, if you fear the Lord, what will happen? You will prolong your days. Why? Because you won't ruin your life with folly and ungodly decisions and alcohol and drugs, promiscuity and so on. You're just going to live longer. And maybe not just longer, maybe you'll live better Because you're going to avoid the damaging consequences of sin that accompany those choices, those poor choices along the way. So this is just a sampling of of these amazing promises of when we fear God, what will God bless us with? And so kind of my encouragement, your exercise this week as as a follow-on is to look up fear of the Lord or fear of God. Note those verses that you find. You're going to find many more blessings, many more reasons, many more enticements to grow in your fear of the Lord in 2024, and in so doing, grow in your wisdom and become more 
like Christ. I don't know if you felt it, you know, before I jumped into this study, I didn't realize really how much the Bible had to say about fearing God. And maybe, as I said earlier, it's the thing we've lost. Maybe we haven't understood that if God wants to bless us, we have to learn how to fear God and hold him in greater reverence and to read his words so that we can come to understand these things better. It is possible to love God and fear God. It is possible to merge these two. And, it's, it's, it, and as you begin to grasp that more and more, it will amaze you. It's, it's the terror of God, but also our protection in the midst of that that brings joy and wonder to us. We have a fearful God, a God to be feared, but he's the same God who wraps his arms around us in love in innumerable way. it's the ways. It's the very wonder of who he is that causes us to be trembling and overwhelmed that such a one as he would want to hang out with me. And therefore, you and I can fear him and love him. They go together. By loving him, you and I learn to fear him. And by fearing him, you and I learn to love him better. And here's what I know. If we and you and I, we get this, this fear right, it will begin to obliterate the other fears that are serving to interfere with your life. For truly, if you know him and he knows you, what is there to be afraid of? Really, what is there to be afraid of? So we'll conclude, as is our custom, to kind of process and consider all that we've just heard in this lesson. Hopefully, you're convinced, I convinced you at least somewhat, or intrigued you somewhat, that there is great wisdom to be unlocked in learning to fear the Lord better in 2024. And so we're going to have our talk at overtime a little bit different. It's going to be a mixture of talking and praying. So this is what I want to encourage you to do. Just grab, you know, three, four people right around you. And I want a few people to share an answer just to the, the question, the talking over question. How do you want to grow in fear of the Lord in 2024? And then about the five-minute mark, um, people who haven't shared are going to pray, and they're just going to petition God to help themselves and everybody else in the group grow in the fear of the Lord uh, in 2024 for the last five minutes. So we've got a 10-minute segment. Service is over, and I'll give you the cue at five minutes when to switch from the top one to the bottom one. So just huddle up with your group there, and let's just have a great time talking and praying and petitioning the Lord that we grow in this arena this year.